Greetings, my friends! <laughs> As you can see, I'm super excited to have you here with me for PlatformCon 2022. My name is Mathieu Frenette. I'm a DevOps engineer manager at Nesto in Montreal. I've been a software engineer for more than 25 years. So that kind of gives away my age. But anyway, I am super passionate about everything uh, cloud native and DevOps. But enough about me. Let's see what we have on the menu today. So uh, we're going to talk about Nesto's growth challenges and also uh, how we address those challenges by creating a generic Elm chart and uh, also how we approach that generic Elm chart at different levels of abstraction so that we can prevent our golden paths from turning into golden cages. So first, we started as a startup. Uh, that was four years ago. We were just a small company with a few developers, a few microservices to manage. But then we grew to more of a scale up size. And that was uh, a, big, uh, a big change. And that came with its usual set of growing pains and challenges. We had to adapt to many more engineers, teams, and the fact that we now had a dedicated DevOps team. Um, so that was my team. <laughs> um, so what we had was uh, as a setup, uh, as a setup for uh, deployments, was that for each microservice we had one micro, one Git repository, and for each one of those we had another sister Git repository that contained the Kubernetes manifest that we wanted to deploy for those microservices. And within each one, we add one branch per environment. And then within each branch, we add copies of loose, like raw Kubernetes manifest to deploy there. So honestly, that worked quite well in the beginnings because uh, the, the people uh, were the same doing development and deployments and also because it was really what you see is what you get. It was super uh, fast that it was a high velocity high speed to market and that's exactly what you want uh, when you're doing uh, lean. However, um, that rapidly grew into um, like many more microservices. So just do the count 30 microservices times three branches. That means 90 branches or copies of all those files that were pretty much like all very similar in terms of structure and functionality, yet all somehow unique in the way they were configured and tweaked. Um, the other thing is that there was no separation of concerns between what developers cared about. For example, this is a deployment, uh, uh, a Kubernetes deployment resource. Uh, developers care more about some specific configuration values, whereas DevOps care more about the boilerplate, the everything that's repeated across multiple uh, microservices. So. All of that was just fused together in, in those files and it was difficult to collaborate. So we refactored our entire deployment structure. We combined all those different uh, infrastructure repos into a single repo, uh, which we could call a mono repo. And instead of using branches, uh, for each environment, we instead used folders. And that was much more lightweight, but the real advantage was that with this new setup, we could have an entire snapshot of the whole system um, 
at each modification that we are doing. So each git commit corresponds now to one snapshot of how all microservices versions and configuration in all environments at one specific point in time. And that's a big deal. So what about uh, all the Kubernetes manifests that we add in so many copies and without uh, separation of concerns? That we handled with Helm. So what is Helm? Helm is the Kubernetes package manager for those who don't know it. Uh, it's made of charts that uh, are basically like packages or sets of YAML resources that you want to deploy. But these are templates uh, with parameters. So to configure those parameters, you provide values file that are basically just YAML, plain YAML files. Uh, and that is a super setup for uh, setting a separation of concerns because typically charts are owned by DevOps because this is the boilerplate that's repeated uh, like across multiple microservices and values file are just the configs that developers care about. So that's exactly what uh, we wanted. Uh, we could have gone with uh, creating a, an individual chart for each microservice, but um, that was not enough for us. We really wanted one unique chart that would be shared across all microservices, no matter uh, the kind of microservice, no matter what uh, they were doing. And that was a big challenge. Uh, so. Uh, that required considerable effort because we needed to figure out the patterns that were common to all those services. Uh, what was common and what was different, what was just boilerplate, what was significant configuration values, extract them into that unique and generic Elm chart uh, in a way that's uh, usable and, and sensible and extract all the values into values file. So that, uh, that makes for a super interesting separation of concerns because uh, we have this chart for DevOps and everything else for developers. And that's a, that was a, a big uh, advancement. So now, when we created that generic Elm chart. We figured that in order not to turn our golden paths into golden cages, we needed to define different abstraction levels at which developers could work. Um, so there's the first level that is complete recipes. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Then if that doesn't work, Developers can fall back to generic modules that they assemble themselves. And then if those just don't cut it, they can fall back to arbitrary custom extensions. So first, uh, complete recipes. These are really for top level constructs. In our specific case, those top level constructs were the following. Front end applications. In our case, it's TypeScript uh, uh, applications with uh, React and backend microservices written in Go and API gateways also written in Go with uh, CrackMD. So this uh, is just in our case. Uh, in other cases, in other companies, it could be totally different. The idea was that in our case, that was our picture. Those complete recipes. Uh, they really should be the path of least resistance if you want developers to adopt them and stick to them in most circumstances. If they're easy to use, they're a no-brainer, then they will just go to, to them like uh, without asking. Also, you should encode all your best practices, for example, things about security, observability, all those things by default in the uh, complete recipes. They should be enabled without having uh, to go out of your way. 
Um, the other thing is DevOps want to have some way to act behind the scene. So these implementation details that uh, DevOps care about should be abstracted from developers. Otherwise, uh, if they are exposed, it becomes very difficult to uh, modify anything without affecting what the developers uh, are doing. And we want to expose only the parameters that are meaningful. And we prefer to start with um, a very small subset of parameters that we know are needed instead of going like uh, too wide and trying to, uh, to, f to uh, forecast the everything that might be needed in the future, because the more you expose, the less abstraction you've got. So it, it has to evolve according to the evolving needs of developers and microservices. Um, one last thing about complete recipes is that it, they provide optional features through feature flags uh, that are turned off by default uh, unless it's the it's the the the, the most uh, the most uh, the, the most likely case. But if it's not something that's likely, they are all turned off by default. And when you turn them on, you want all of them to be automatically integrated together and with the microservice or the front end app or whatever without having to go out of your way. They're all pre-wired with, without having to do anything. And that's uh, the interesting thing about those complete recipes. When you cannot go with a, 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 a complete recipe or when the recipe is just missing some little things, you can use reusable building blocks or generic modules that we call them. Uh, kind of sushi style, like pick and choose. And in uh, an example that I would really recommend is Cloud Pussy's uh, mono chart. That chart is really working at that level. It's not high level recipes because these would be just like too specific to an organization. And it's not like super low level. It's really just uh, in the, the middle. So um, those re reusable building blocks, they really represent some kind of middle ground in the sense that they preserve some level of abstraction to let DevOps uh, perform their magic behind the scene uh, and also be able to encode some of the, uh, the best practices into them. But they put developers behind the wheel. It lets them assemble everything as they see fit and that's really the the goal here they're not as tightly integrated together as with a, uh, a complete recipe but that's really the point to let developers assemble them it's not that like i said an either or situation you can start with a, a recipe and just add a few building building blocks that might be uh, missing all right so um, last, last uh, abstraction level, but not the least. Uh, so for exceptional cases, we need to provide exceptional measures to developers. So if it just doesn't support uh, what they, they want to do, they have to have some, uh, some escape route. So these are, for example, raw resources. This is in the values file. There's a section where you can just put like arbitrary uh, manifest uh, YAML and it will just be passed into the chart as is, like as, as a pass through. If you want to have a, an example of how that works, just have a look at uh, any raw chart. Just Google raw chart or use this link for one example. But it's basically just it. it it just uh, renders whatever values you pass uh, as YAML. It just rends renders, as, uh, renders it as is. Um, and finally, if the, um, the, uh, the generic chart is not enough and even raw resources would be too complicated to use, uh, we have to let developers 
define their own custom chart or use a third party chart. Uh, and what we want in those cases is that if they, they go with this third option, it should still be integrated with everything with CI CD and the rest of infrastructure, just as if you were using the golden paths. Uh, developers should not be penalized or isolated from your ecosystem just because they're trying to do something that's not covered by the golden paths, uh, because otherwise they would be more like golden cages. Uh, be, a, be wary of those uh, like escape routes because they might eventually become the, uh, the way of doing things and that's not what we want. So developers should be aware that they should only exceptionally resort to using them and uh, we should as DevOps track how they're used, like observe and get feedback from developers and try to refactor as much as possible all those usages that are like exceptions and figure the patterns and if it's something that uh, that repeats itself to refactor that into uh, golden paths or complete recipes or uh, like, uh, like uh, reusable uh, modules. So that's it. Uh, thank you so much for attending this presentation and hopefully it will give you some insight on your own uh, cloud journey. So farewell, my friends. May the clouds be with you. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Sorry. <laughs> Ciao. Bye bye.